Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the MFA Fine Arts Talk Show. Um, this afternoon, it's I'm really excited, honestly, to be introducing Athena Latocha. Um, so some of you are aware that opportunities in the art world to show your work, grants, residencies, teaching positions, even modest ones like this, like giving a talk, oftentimes they don't happen, they don't come about in the most ideal of ways. It's because, you know, there's a lot of buzz about somebody, somebody, you know, you're in a conversation and somebody says, oh yeah, you should really check out so-and-so. It's like this sort of word of mouth economy. And, you know, that's okay, but I have in my mind this platonic ideal of how it's supposed to happen, which is someone sees your work and then is taken by it and interested in it and then starts, you know, Googles you and starts following you. And then they invite you to do something because really they responded to what you do. And that's how Athena got here this afternoon because one, afternoon uh, in 2021, sort of the late days of the pandemic, um, I walked into Smack Mellon, that big industrial gallery space in Dumbo in Brooklyn. And there was a terrific group show on called Land Akin. Land Akin, so you know, playing on the word kin and um, ancestry and, and family. And on the wall was this enormous, monumental work on paper um, by an artist I'd never heard of. Um, and it was ginormous. I mean, I feel like it was the size of this wall. It felt that big. And it, you know, how it works on paper that have a lot of stuff on them can like buckle and hover. It was almost like it was levitating there in front of the wall, but also, it had this subtle, gentle power and monumentality that just really got under my skin. It, it felt like it was the product of some kind of dynamic elemental process, not some kind, of, not not the kind of conceptual deliberate strategy of making. Although I also realized as I read more that there were a lot of ideas under the surface. Um, but something very uh, protean almost. So Athena appropriately um, talks about her work as existing, quote, in the wake of earthworks. Earthworks artists from the 1960s and 70s, thinking of perhaps Nancy Holt, Richard Long, Robert Smithson, others, um, particularly in light of how she sees, and this is another quote, correlations between mark making and displacement of materials made by industrial equipment uh, and natural events. So she's thinking a lot about, about land, about history, about how we live with and relate to land and how that's changed over the decades and centuries, both as a result of you know, shifts in economy, but also um, cultural and political shifts having to do with colonization and, and decolonization. At least that's my interpretation. Uh, she's had solo shows uh, at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art in Richmond, uh, at JDJ Tribeca, at the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Ice House in Garrison, New York, Brick in Brooklyn, the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota, and Q Art Foundation, just a few blocks north of us, in a place that you should consider submitting to for their open call. She's had a lot of group shows, and I'm going to just name some that jumped out, jumped off her resume uh, and into my attention. The Institute of Contemporary Art at Maine College of Art and Design in Portland, Maine, National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., Sundaram Tagore Gallery here in New York, Weatherspoon Art Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. Gallery Lalong, where I also saw her work in a really terrific group show. The Akta Lakota Museum and Cultural Center in Chamberlain, South Dakota. 
And here you're going to see, you can hear the names of a bunch of venues that I think no artist who's ever presented here has shown at before. Um, and I put them down here uh, to give you a sense of the depth and breadth of the cultural world in what in uh, states like South Dakota and Wyoming is sometimes called Indian country. Um, and I don't know if it's okay for me is a, just to say that, to use that term, but um, but I've heard it used. Um, South Dakota Art Museum in Brookings, South Dakota, the Heritage Center in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Is that on the Pine Ridge Reservation? Um, the Brinton Museum in Bighorn, Wyoming, um, Greater New York at MoMA PS1, the 2021 edition. The um, Idol Yorn, Idle York Museum of American Indians and Western Art in Indianapolis, Indiana. Fridman Gallery, when it was up in Beacon, New York during the pandemic. And it's it's now back uh, in the East Village or you know, on Bowery. Calicoon Fine Arts, may it rest in peace. Um, the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota. The New Orleans Museum of Art in New Orleans, Louisiana. Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Also, not a lot of people who end up speaking here have shown at Crystal Bridges, which is an important institution founded by an, an heir to the Walmart fortune, interestingly enough, and apparently doing really good work. Um, the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School uh, in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Phyllis Harriman Mason Gallery at the Art Students League of New York. AIR Gallery uh, in Brooklyn and Artist Space here in New York City. Her work has been supported by the Rockef Rockefeller Brothers Fund the American Academy in Rome, New York Foundation for the Arts, the Harpo Foundation. Is that Oprah's foundation? Oh, okay. Not Oprah's foundation. Joan Mitchell Foundation, Standing, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, um, the Vermont Studio Center, the Sharp Walenta Studio Program, Wave Hill, and the Rockefeller uh, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, where she did a residency in Captiva in Florida. And her work has been reviewed and discussed a lot, notably in the New York Times, Art in America, the art newspaper Bomb, and Hyperallergic. Lastly, she received an MFA from Stony Brook University, a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And she also studied at the Artists, Art Students League of New York for several years before going to Chicago. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Athena Latocha. Thank you, Mark, for the generous introduction and Isabel for coordinating everything here to get us set up. And thank you um, for your attention this afternoon, this evening, to um, allow me to come in and talk to you a little bit about the work. Welcome. <laughs> We're just starting, <laughs> so feel free to get comfortable. Um, so this this afternoon, I just want to touch upon um, uh, just a just a couple of things. Uh, first, you know, I want to talk about my background and how this has shaped my own understanding of the world, and and how it's also shaped my understanding of the work and the the psychology of the studio. Um, second, I want to just, I'll just talk through a few of the, uh, or several of the larger projects. I won't go into the smaller studio pieces, but more, more of the, the larger pieces to show you a little bit about the process, the methodology, and, you know, maybe some of the madness that goes into making the work. You know, I started as a painter. And everyone here, I'm sure, is familiar with uh, Gustin, uh, Philip Gustin. And um, when I studied, looked at his work, it, after understanding the whole history, the arc of his work, it became more clear to me, you know, that sense of process and the evolution that your work goes through um, when looking at it through a few decades. Things start to make sense. You start pulling things through time. And that's how I began to see Gustin's work, starting with his earlier work, going through the abstraction, the poetic phase, and then coming back through with his, um, the gnarly, gritty uh, 
illustration representation of, of what a world is. So this quote became very important to me to understand what I'm doing, what I'm what I think I'm doing, um, and where it comes from. So you start with yourself, you start with your environment, you start with what you know, right? And this is another artist, uh, Robert Smithson is somebody that I've looked at quite often, um, looking at how do we represent ourselves? How do we look at the day to day? How do we look at the environment that we find ourselves in that you might feel perhaps a little more viscerally and want to respond to a little more materially? And then looking at that sense of time, nature, entropy, the, thing, the fact that you know nothing's ever finished in the natural world, right? And for me, it, it goes into a, a sort of messiness that I think as artists, it's um, finding a way to contend with that. Um, and one of the reasons why I slightly started pivoting from painting, wanting to sense that the material and feeling that material a little bit more so I, I want to go back to the beginning. And for me, the beginning is growing up in Alaska. I don't know, has, has anyone ever been up, been to Alaska? Few hands, great. And did you draw, go around the entirety of Alaska? Did you, did you stay in Anchorage, did you know? Where did you go? You know, the Dang, okay. Not a lot of people get to Juno on their first trip up. That's amazing. That's amazing. And someone else went to Alaska. Where did you go? Juno. What? <laughs> Everybody's going to Juno. Okay, well that that's amazing. And what were you doing in Juno? What's that? Hiking. Okay. Because it's uh, Juno's very isolated. You don't really, you can't just drive from Juno up to the rest of Alaska. Um, but what we're what we're looking at here is the uh, is an image of Denali National Park off of one of the smaller mountains, looking down the slope. And what you see, I don't, can I do this here? Can you? Oh, great! So you see these different um, this valley here, and you see this here. This is so you you get here. This, this image kind of sums up a lot of things for me. It sums up the, uh, the way that nature interacts with material. Um, so you have this, this area here, this is a valley that was carved by a glacier. And over here, this is a, a cut into the land by a river, right? So looking at the way that nature moves material, these are, these are the things that, um, I grew up surrounded by looking at and wondering about. Here's a here's a very easily accessible glacier. So if you get to Anchorage, you can drive about an hour and a half and a, about a 20, 30 minute walk, hike, walk. Um, you can access this, this bird, bird glacier. And it's on the side of a mountain. It's accessible year round and um, what I really love about glaciers is that the water, they're constantly moving and they're constantly shaping the earth underneath it. And you can see down here and under here, these caverns that were carved by the water from the meltwater. And in the foreground, this it's like a, it's like a stream that was very shallow. Um, but it's a little river, um, but it, it also is constantly changing. So a friend and I, on my one of my last trips up, we walked across it. We were able to scramble across on various rocks. But by the time we got to the other side, those rocks were no longer accessible because of the river was constantly moving. So we had to find another way back, which involved getting wet this time. So uh, so the fact that nature is constantly moving, things are shifting, things are being carved. These are the these are it, it, just further ideas of um, inspiration, you know, consideration in the studio. This is exit um, 
what is it called? The Harding Ice Field. So it's near, you went down to the Kenai Peninsula, you went down to the National. Okay. So on the other side of the Kenai Peninsula is Seward. You know, and in between Seward and Kenai, it, you could camp out back here next to the rivers, but you can um, take a day hike up. It's about a three hour hike, four hour hike up the mountain. And you can overlook this massive ice field. And if you are lucky to have a quiet day, you can sit on the edge here. Where, where is it? Right on the ledge here. You can sit and you can hear, you can hear the glacier moving. You can hear the ice cracking if you have a clear day and no wind. But I was there, it was windy out, so I didn't get to hear it. <laughs> My mother did though, she, she's gone up there a number of times. Um, so, so what I'm, what I'm interested in, you see all the sediment that's at the top, how that debris is settling in from the atmosphere, from the melting of the glacier over the seasons, and it settles into the grooves, into the cracks of the glacier. And this is, I can't, I don't even, it's like hundreds of square miles and you have several different glaciers converging. So imagining all of those ice sheets coming together, the mass, the weight of it, the compression, and thinking about how this has been there for how many tens of thousands of years. And I love the line, the marks, right? That movement, because it gives you an idea of how that glacier is flowing. In just a detail shot. So glaciers, I've just, you know, it wasn't like I started out going, I want to do work about glaciers. Whenever I would go home and whenever I was moving around, I just saw things that I was interested in. And slowly things became more clear why. I didn't know it was the mark making. I didn't know it was the way and the massive, you know, a glacier can move up a mountain. I didn't know that. You know, it was just looking. And in a similar way, when I left undergrad, I was really interested in finding other ways to paint. Um, the brush was not enough. I wanted to, you know, there was a lot of like psychological reasons why I wanted to put it down. There was um, cultural reasons why I wanted to put it down. But most importantly is I wanted to find another way to develop a relationship with the material, with the paint. So I started looking at, does anyone recognize this? You know what this is? Right. It's a um, it's a it's a palette. It's a, a palette by a um, her name is Karen Avieta. She's a Hopi painter, and this was her great grandmother's palette, where she would grind ochre, charcoal, pigments, and in the upper right corner, you know the the, the palette's only about this big. It's very small, um, and in the upper right corner are two blades of grass. You know, and that, that's what she was painting with. You know, she was very generously sharing um, her process, her techniques, her methodology um, in one of the national parks over uh, a side over at the Grand Canyon. You know, I thought it was very generous of her to share that, you know, this is how I do, how I make the work. You know, so I was, I was very grateful to have the time to speak with her. Does anyone recognize what these are? This is, um, these are uh, Lakota bone brushes. So, and these are actually, they're maybe like one by two inches. They fit in the palm of your hand. You can see the texture from like the inner inside of the bone where you might see the marrow, you know, where it gets all kind of cellular looking when you cut a bone in half. So the Lakota were using these to, uh, to paint with, you know. And it's, you know, and I just thought it was interesting that the anthropologists called them bone brushes, right? Because they're not really brushes. Um, but again, this is just looking at finding other ways to work with the material. And at the same time, um, I had discarded the brushes. Uh, I was here in New York trying to find another way to paint, another way to move the paint on the panel. And um, I was trying to find like, around New York City trying to find rocks or you know something something natural that I could just 
work with and I couldn't find anything. It was so hard. How do you find, you know, try to find a rock in New York City? You know, <laughs> I remember, you know, it's just like, you know, bordering theft to like steal out of gardens. But, um, but what, what it compelled me to consider more was the impulses when you feel connected to something, when you find something that's fascinating, something that's you're curious about and bringing that close, bringing it into the studio. So what I started doing is um, following, you know, and being true to that. So I was captivated with tire shred growing up in Alaska, we're on the road a lot, driving a lot. And so I would see tire shred and it always just looked so fascinating, you know, because there was something mysterious and evocative about it. So this is a photograph of me along Route 66, picking up a piece of tire shred from uh, uh, trucks um, and just throwing it in the car as I was heading over to a residency. So I have tire shred from different parts of the country in my collection now. Um, and driving out to take a look at Smithson Spiral Jetty, you know, learning, learning the importance of um, sight but also being able to go through it and look at look at these places in time, right? The the archive, what we learn in art history, what's in the books, it's it's really you feel it's very displacing because you don't really get that sense of um, of what the work is unless you're standing in front of it, in front of it or inside it, right? There's a friend of mine out there walking the spiral. So again, being in situ, being in location. So um, in 2017, 2016, I was invited to put together a, a solo show um, in New Mexico and not having ever been there, it was important for me to come out and see what that area looked like, you know, to feel the, that environment. And so what I'm, a lot of my practice, um, and you all do this all the time, you're taking photos, you're take, capturing footage. Um, so my my practice started becoming very, uh, it started becoming very important to what I do. How do you understand the experience? You know, how do you understand what that environment is? You know, you not only just being physically inside it, walking it, running it, tasting it, feeling it, um, uh, taking photographs of it, taking video of it, seeing it from different directions. How does it feel when you lie on it? Can you, you know, what do, what what sounds, you know, do you hear? You know, all these things, what are the fragrances? All these things started becoming very, um, you know, I, I was curious in the psychological sense of what happens in the process what happens in the studio when you bring all of this information back, you know, and what, what information do you uncover when you have boots on the ground? It's very different, right? So what I learned out there is I, I was trying to figure out what was, what was important. And I found myself going to these clay beds. That was not my original intent. I was I was trying to get to this, you know, into these canyons that were carved by the wind and the the the, uh, the arroyos, the the monsoons that would come through. But I found myself going back to the clay beds and collecting samples. You see in the bucket there, uh, collecting like 10, 15, 20 pounds of the soil and bringing it back. Um, on the top of the canyon, this is a view looking down at the mesa. So you can actually see the effects of time and weather, the rain and the wind carving out these capped hoodoos. You know, and it was absolutely breathtaking because you're up there with the birds, you know, and the fragrances surrounded by the sagebrush and the pinyon trees. But it was bringing all that back into the studio and trying to figure it out. Like, what are you going to do? Like, how are you? You know, and so you 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 bring back into the studio your sense of space, your sense of scale, your sense of movement, your how you're navigating the terrain, and just trying to literally put it all together somehow. And so I, you know, always feel like you know Stanley Whitney is always talking about like I never know what I'm doing. You know. I, and then you see what he's doing and you kind of go, how could you not know what you're doing? Because it you know, looks, you know, like this. 
you know, but literally like getting in there, um, bringing the, bringing the, some of the soil sample back. And, you know, in those moments that you're trying to figure out you're, you have these moments where you're just grinding the earth down, you know, to pulverize it. Um, and th throwing it all together somehow. And this is the work that was created for, uh, for the museum exhibition. Um, so I wanted it to be, to be basically knocking out one of the walls. So it was ceiling to flo uh, floor to ceiling and wall to wall. So the institution generously removed some of the molding so that we could, uh, we could get the work up. So they were able to take an, all of that into consideration to put the best uh, intent forward. The title of the work is La Bajada Red in, uh, in honor of the La Bajada Mesa that was blasted by the Marine Army Corps of Engineers to build the highway going from Albuquerque to Santa Fe. It was previously a walking trail that became a um, animal trail that became a um, wagon trail until it was deemed to be um, a highway and the Army Corps of Engineers blasted out and the local folks from the Pueblos um, had their clay, bled, clay beds um, blasted open. And so you, you take all that history and that knowledge back into the studio and it kind of um, influences the way and shapes the direction of um, the perhaps the emotive response to what you think you're doing and bringing all that back into the studio. So the surfaces can come kind of get built up a little bit and the um, the earth is actually embedded onto into the ink film. One of the other projects that I was, Crystal Bridges invited me to come out and uh, participate in a group exhibition there. And they knew at the time that a lot of the work was site responsive work. So they knew that I needed to come out and visit and um, spend some time there. So has anybody been out to the Ozark Mountains? visited the Ozark. So I had no idea they were, they're plateau mountains, so they're heavily eroded. Um, and what was always so interesting when you, when you're going out to site and you start looking around for what you're interested in working with, you're looking for your information, your source material, you're trying to find it. It's the various bits of history that come up to meet you. So the site that I found, um, was actually, uh, it's a national um, national um, military site, national military park. What is it? National, 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 it's a, it's a, they're preserving this battlefield. So the, the green fields that you see here, those were the battlefields of um, one of the westernmost uh, field uh, battles of the of the Civil War, and you know, so of course that's rife with a lot of controversy. Looking at the history, um, but then it was also looking at the geology and uh, what was going on with the geological layers, and so. I get to learn a little bit about uh, lysagong bands, which are the calcium and sandstone or calcium and deposit stratification that creates these kind of cellular kind of structures. Um, but again, when I was walking the site, you know, I mean, where do you go and see a national park where they're, you know, doing such extensive burning? I mean, there. This is one of the few parks that actually it's written into their. Um, you know, their protocols there, they do prescribe burning here at this site so that they can maintain the look and feel of the battlefield when it was fought in, you know, in the 1860s. There was, these are all agricultural areas, so they were heavily grazed. So when the war was waged and the folks were out there fighting, they had no coverage. You know, they had, they were fully exposed. So the park goes around and they do this prescribed burning and they're literally like, I mean, this this is a felled tree burned to ash. So walking the grounds, I mean, it was pungent. I mean, it felt like that fire just happened. So it kind of embeds all of that information into the subconscious, into your 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 memory, your experience of place, um, in a way that I could have never predicted, right? 
And this is actually, um, I don't know, can, I don't know if anyone can read this. Yes. So, uh, so I'm out there working for for a week, taking lead imprints, working on the site. I'm just taking a break, and I walk behind this this cliff face that had cleaved away from the the bluff, the limestone, the bluff there. And I see these numbers. You know, it's 18, 18, 1890, right? Or eight, it was eighteen ninety. But there's somebody's name was carved on the top, and there's a date, September eighteenth. Um, and one of the rangers came back out and told me, they said they'd never seen this before. It was new to them. And quite often, um, fallen soldiers, families of fallen soldiers might come back and, and um, memorialize the site by carving the name in it, or the veteran, the person who fought in that war, um, might come back and memorialize uh, their being in that, that battle. Um, and what, what really started what I started learning is like, this was the site that I wanted to work at, right? This cliff face, this rock face. But what I started learning was like the, the land upon which I was standing was where the Confederate soldiers were taking shelter from cannon fire down below. And so this section of the, there was this section that was carved on, it was in between this tiny little narrow passageway where a part of the, the bluff had cleaved off and created this amazing shelter, like a shield. So, you know, so, you know, in, in a way you're just like, you know, you're, you're thinking about like the horrors of war, the, the destruction, the human, the human cost. Um, you know, family against family, fighting on both sides. You know, and these are these are this is all information that I never thought to go out to seek. You know, but things that I became more and more invested in because I wanted to become aware of where I was, what happened there. You know, what does this mean? Who put this here? You know, so all of that information and the lead sheets that I removed off the cliff face, I was shipped back to New York and this was the studio at the time. And I was trying to do, create the work on paper and then do the lead imprints and laminate the back with fiberglass and trying to figure that out. And in the whole process, I started thinking, oh my God, I feel like I'm in, you know, in, in a battle, you know, because crawling, I'm crawling around on my back. I'm, you know, you know I mean, you do funny things to do your work sometimes and you find yourself in compromising positions physically, literally. Um, but uh, this is the work that resulted. It's 11 by 22 feet. It was commissioned by um, Crystal Bridges. So it, it becomes important for me to actually source uh, where the earth comes from, where the soils come from. So here um, I'm honoring that and putting P Ridge um, in the in the medium. Some detail of the crenellations from the uh, lead imprint taken from the bluff, and this is just a sample, uh, an idea, uh, an image of the soil that was embedded in the ink films. So I, I'm just just really curious, like how all of that information that we're you know, absorbing how it influences us psychologically in the studio space and how it might come out and reveal itself in the work. So the work that Mark saw um, was based off of uh, time spent down in New Orleans. And when you think about New Orleans and areas along the Gulf there, you know, what do we think of? You know, when we think of New Orleans, anybody? Any ideas, thoughts that come to mind? Katrina, surge, storm surge, right? Um, you think of the levees, you think of, you know, um, toxic spills, the oil spills, right? Um, so I was, you know, heavy rains, all of these things. I, you know, I was, so I was fascinated uh, to go down to New Orleans for three months and immerse myself in this type of environment and, and to work with these types of ideas. Um, you know, and I had never been in a swamp before. Like, what is a swamp? 
what does that feel like? You know, so going out there, the first thing I did, boots on the ground, unpack in the studio, throw everything in the studio, and then let me go and 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 meet the, this this meet this swamp. And I just I just fell in love. Um, there's it, it just pulls you right in. You know, the creatures watching the alligators. I would go out and watch them and watch them move the way that they move in their environment. You know, and it all starts making sense. You know, you see how everything's connected. You know, the Spanish moss. And then going out, once I got the studio up and going, um, going out and taking a look around, looking at the plantations and how the language around plantations shifts. Um, folks in around that area were referring to these. There's signs out referring to these, some of the... Uh, the homes where enslaved people were kept, um, referring to them as tenant houses. And you're going, <laughs> my friends are taking me out there for talking and they're like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's, it's not that. Um, it, it was just very eye-opening how you understand context, how you understand content in context. Um, looking at the sugar mills, Looking at the cane burning, I was able to be down there during cane burning season and to smell the fragrance of the burnt sugar in the air and see the fi fires for miles away. Looking at big industry, Louisiana, some of the lowest regulation in the country. So you have all of our, you know, what, what are they called today? Um, forever chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that forever chemicals being produced, right? You know, and we're all these things built into our society. Like, how can we step away from these things? You know, they're inextricably linked to how we exist today, modern living. You know, so again, going around with cameras, capturing video footage, you know, getting a sense, smelling the fragrances, you know, smelling the chemical sites, you know. And then going back into the studio, trying to figure it all out. But what I really felt um, and found going down there and, you know, how all of this, how all of this infect, affects you, how it infects you. Um, and I found like after spending days going through these sites, um, I found myself going back to the swamps. And when I would go back to the swamps, you know, into an environment like this and standing in this and looking out and feeling this, I felt like I could breathe again. I felt like I could, there was like an immense sigh of relief. Um, and all of that is what went into this work here that was presented first at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, and then it came straight off the wall from New Orleans and straight to New York, where it was exhibited at um, Smack Mellon. You know, it's 11 by 17 feet. It's incorporating uh, mud from the Mississippi River, from the mouth of the river, which is New Orleans, right? The title is Bulbancha, which is, uh, Bulbancha is the original name of the place that we now know as New Orleans. It's a Choctaw word. It means place of many tongues, place of many languages, because uh, similar to New York, it was an area of trade. There'd always been people of many, many backgrounds, many cultures, many languages there, just as New York has been. Detail of the Spanish moss and a detail of the, of the Mississippi mud. I'm going to talk about one more project, um, if that's all right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. This is a project out at uh, Greenwood Cemetery. Has anybody been out to Greenwood? It's an amazing place. Oh, my God. It's just, I mean, I love cemeteries, but I mean, this place is, it's just under 500 acres. It dates back to, what does it date back to like 1830 or something like that? You know, so if you if you want if you're interested in you know Victorian cemeteries and design, um, you know what do they say? The Victorians they knew how to mourn. You know, mm -hmm. some of there's a 
<laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, well, Tiffany's buried out there, Basquiat's buried out there. So you can uh, uh, go visit the, uh, their, their burial sites. Um, but so I was invited by a curator, his name's Harry Weil. And Harry was a, he was a PhD student when I was a grad student. So I met him in, in, um, in grad school and, and we stayed in touch. So as he's moved around to different positions, he, you know, he said, Athena, I know you do these things and you know, would you be interested in doing something out here? You know, would you be interested in coming out to Greenwood for something? And I was like, oh my God, that'd be amazing. But I don't, I don't know what uh, I would do. And when you're walking around, I mean, it's 500 acres. How do you do something in 500 acres? Like, I mean, I don't know. It took me a long time to figure it out. I mean, because I mean, you start with these Gothic arches. You're like, how could I, you know, why? Why would I want to do something to compete with this? I mean, it's fine, just so it is. Um, the beginning of the project, we were looking at installing uh, in this building here, which is a former greenhouse of a, a florist who was uh, very well positioned their business right outside the gates of Greenwood. So um, we're, we're florists, um, or wire, we're, we're, W-E-I-R. Um, so Greenwood just acquired this. So I was gonna do an installation inside, uh, inside this uh, uh, greenhouse, but that fell through. They started do construction earlier. So I was having to pivot and think, you know, not knowing what was where the final location was going to be. Um, this is, uh, you know, some images from the grounds. And I was shown this as a possibility for a site for an interior piece. So the, the deal was to do an interior and an exterior component for, for the project. It was supported by the NEA and I was very grateful for that. And I was showing the space like this, and I was like, oh my God, like I can't even see what's going on in there to try to envision a project in this space. Um, but it was a project that, re, you know, it, 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 um, the development of it was over the course of about a year and a half to two years. So there was ample time to go back and revisit and revisit and revisit. And each time I would see it, I would see it differently. So it was used, it's a historic chapel, you know, and you have marble, limestone, stained glass. You have this ornate uh, uh, lighting chandelier. Um, you have organ. Uh, there was an organ built into the chapel. And I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. Does that work? No, it doesn't work. But all of this goes into how you understand something, right? What is this place? What is there? Um, the bellows, you know, for all the pipes or you know, that door that's open in the right in the back over there, up on the altar. It was all there, um, but just not, not functional anymore. So when I first go into a place, I have to walk it out, measure it out, tape out, and, and put down visuals. So I taped out, you know, what the heights were, sight lines, you know. So I'm just putting that in there. I don't know if y'all are just interested in that or not, but curious. Um, and the idea was to bring something into the space, like how much space do I, can I actually occupy and leave room for a person to, people to walk around? You know, you have ADA requirements. Um, um, so the idea was to bring in, um, bring in one of the trees that, um, they have an amazing, well, it's like a library of trees. You can see almost any kind of tree out there at Greenwood. Um, so they have a large horticulture department and their horticulture department has a, uh, I didn't know about this, but they have a, they have a call list, um, trees that are diseased or dying. Um, so I found out from them. So it's talking to all the various departments, getting to know them and in having these conversations with them, it reveals more information to you and it expands your capacity to envision what's possible. And, um, so I didn't know that, but I just knew that I liked talking to different people and getting different perspectives. So the horticulture department said, well, we have these trees, well, you know, we, maybe we can, you know, what, what size tree are you looking for? And I was like, oh, big one, <laughs> you know, something, something about 
25 to 35 feet, something like that um, with the root system. Um, and they said, well, we could, we could, we don't normally excavate them. We usually just cut them down and um, mulch them because they, they do everything right there on the grounds. So they put together a list of, of five of their top candidates and we went around and we looked at all of them. And we found, it's like, it was ridiculous. The first one was way too big. The second one was too small. The next one was too old. Because if you try to bundle up the branches, if it's too old and already dying, all that is gonna crack and it will break off, right? So I was having to think about all these things. And um, so the last one they showed me, I was like, really Goldilocks, right? Oh my God, the last one was just right. It was just perfect. Um, so, and it was actually, for me, it was kind of horrifying to thinking about, um, pulling up, uh, excavating this tree, but it was dying. It was diseased and it was heavily damaged from uh, one of the limbs from a storm. So they were going to have to take it down anyway, um, for the safety of the environment. Um, so they went in there with, um, a very small, narrow excavator. And it was on a some burial plots that date back to um, the 1800s. Um, so some of so we had to talk to the um, the director of monuments and memorials. I was like, oh my god, what's that? It's you know the, overseeing like all the headstones and the mausoleums and all of the monuments that are out there. I never thought about uh, cemeteries like this. You know, so she had to pull out her plans because some of the um, some of the graves, some of the actual grave sites, were earthened over. It's five hundred acres. How do you manage and maintain every single grave site? You know, so some of them get earthened over, and so some of the sites were buried. So she had to go. Okay, there's something here, and. I'm just giving you like background information, probably not really that interesting. <laughs> but but I, for me, I, I was curious about that because I was just like, I never had to think about those things before. You never had to, well, first of all, I never knew I was going to be working in a graveyard and doing a project where we're going to be excavating on the grounds, which were um, burial sites. So being able, doing that in a, in a, um, in a good way, you know, with a good heart, a uh, good mind, uh, you know, with a good intent. Um, so it was it was very humbling, um, knowing that you were uh, going in there to remove this tree and then um, finding graves that were so earthened over and and being able to reset the stones, reset the headstones. Um, and give give visibility to some of those again. So this is the tree being excavated. It's uh, a little over thirty five feet um, from from the root system to the tip of the canopy. Um, this is so that was there's three parts of that project, and I'm starting to go a little bit over, and I hope that's okay. I'll try to move a little faster. So there's three components. The interior component, which was in the chapel, and then there are two trees outside. So it was again going around to the horticulture department. Okay, I want to, I want to, I would love to wrap one of your trees in lead, but I don't want to. Um, I'm concerned about putting anything, any long term uh, contact of the lead to a living tree. So they said, well, we have several dead trees around here if you want to work on a dead tree. I was like, really? <laughs> You know, you know, again, it's the conversations that are important um, that can lead to information. So they become, you know, part of the process. Um, so they, they, the horticulture again took me around, uh, the department took me around and showed me a couple different trees, beech trees that had, uh, this tree actually died during Hurricane Sandy. So it's, it, it's now 12 years, um, you know, or 14 years. So it's, um, so it's been decaying for over a decade. This tree was two years old. It was diseased and dying. So they had to remove the limbs because they became a problem. They became a, a, a hazard for visitors to, to, the, to the cemetery. So they had to cut those branches off, but they would like to memorialize 
the beech trees because of just the grandeur and the beauty of beech trees, European beech trees. And these are also, there's a disease going around of, with the uh, European beech trees. So they say maybe within 30 years, there might not be any beech trees over here on the East Coast. You know, and I was like, what? You know, you know so again, everything through conversations. Um, so, oops, got this one out of sight. So this is, so we went into production mode. Uh, this is bringing that tree into the chapel. The chapel doors were only seven feet wide. So we had to bundle it up tight to get it through the doors intact. Um, the crew outside, they were going, well, we can break off the, and I'm going, oh my God. It just, because uh, you, I don't know, it, it started for me, it was like um, trying if, to break off the roots or to break off the branches. You know, I started feeling that more, you know, and I'm going, no, 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 I don't want to break anything off. I don't, I, let's, you know, I really wanted to bring it intact because it felt like a, um, you know, I was feeling it like an act of violence or an assault. Um, so I started feeling very, um, it started personally um, influencing my thinking and my feeling. This is the small piece. Um, this is the small uh, work wrapped in lead that um, it's still up right now. It'll be coming down in the next, within the next month. Um, it's only um, eight feet high, 17 feet in diameter, right? Another shot from another angle. The larger tree, we, um, this is it clad in lead. So it, 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 once you change the material, like looking at it as just a tree, as a, as, as a tree of its own, it feels like a tree, but when you clad it in something, how it transforms the object and your mind can take it somewhere else, it opens up the reading possibilities, you know, and then the season seen at different times of the year, seeing it from different angles, you know, and, and that's one thing that, you know, I never have the opportunity to really understand and see the work, at, you know, because I, I'm starting with an idea and I'm either in it, I, I work on the floor so the ink washes are made on the floor and I'm inside them. And they're like 10 by 17 by 22 by 40 by 50 feet. I don't know what that looks like until it goes on the wall. And so quite often it's the curator or the preparators or the registrars that see it first. You know, so there's always that that moment of horror in the reveal, right? You know, the trauma. Um, so this is um, a different angle of the work. You know, later in the winter, it was installed during the late summer. So it had the foliage of the green and then the winter came and you have the work in the winter. What is it that famous Rodin sculpture Colbert? A lot of people say yes, and then other people said Rodin. You know, so you know it. It you know we all have we all come to things with our own knowledge, right? Our own knowledge base, so we can see that in it. You know, we always will. We just can't help but do that. Um, and the the piece in the in the um, this was the piece in the uh, in the chapel. So. You know, and again, it's it's ironic or fascinating how everything comes together because I was like, oh my God, like we're bringing the tree in and we had to prepare the tree to bring it into the chapel. So we had to wash the tree outdoors. We had to wash all the earth off of it. And I was like, oh my God, it's like washing the body. Um, and then we had to prepare the body, you know, and then we had to, um, all the leaves were gonna fall off, they're gonna die and fall off and they were gonna be a huge mess to clean up on the other end. So we had to like strip all the leaves off of the tree. And then you're going, oh my God, it's said, I mean, so they, it was it was very unusual because everything started becoming and having these religious overtones, you know, and you're like, God damn, I was brought up a Catholic, you know? <laughs> and so you started thinking about the Holy Trinity and there's three pieces and, but you know, disregard all of that you can just delete that um but but how this it started 
And then I started thinking, oh my God, I, I'm bringing the tree into the chapel and, the ch and it's laying to rest in the chapel. Uh, this is a view that nobody would get to see. This is um, taken from 16 feet up, looking down. So you can see just a little bit of the, the chandelier on top there. But you can see the, the root system encapsulated, the, uh, the canopy encapsulated, so it was nobody could see in. And this is just, uh, just want to share just a short video. That was an organ drum because I wanted to bring the organ back to life. Because you you go into the space and you see it like right in the top right corner. And what's, of course, is completely blown out with the light, but it's not that bright in there. Um, but what's, what is fascinating about making work in these environments is um, thinking about all those various aspects thinking about how the work changes in the environment throughout the course of the day, the stained glass, right? The light, the sun would move through the same stained glass and project a, onto the opposite walls and it would move across the work. So it had a very kind of uh, like a spectral kind of feel to it. And then having that drone that organ drone playing, it was it was like a, a two hour organ drone on a continuous loop, you know, and it just went constantly. Um, we pulled a couple of uh, oak benches out from the morgue um, that were decommissioned and we put them back into play so people would have a place to come in and sit and just be in that environment. So, So I, I just want to end the presentation to you all. Um, thank you for your time um, and patience listening to all the various stories. Um, I have work currently up at these locations here. So if you want to see some, uh, some of the two-dimensional work, some of the lead-based work, and then, the, like I said, uh, at the bottom here, the greenwood, the two pieces outdoors in greenwood, those, we can, those will be coming down within a month. You know, so if you want to go take a look at those, they're they're out there on Battle Hill. And I was like, oh my God, again, name, you know, like how things influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you.